Maniacs, how we doing? This is part two of a video series where I am building a Tamiya M1A2 Abrams Septus 2 main battle tank. And I'm going to show you how you can make one just like mine. Stick around, this is going to be a good one, I promise. If you liked this video, I bet you did. Don't forget to subscribe, comment down below, hit that like button, and don't forget to share. Model friends, first thing we're going to do is coat our entire model in Vallejo Desert Pan Surface Primer. And we're going to be spraying it from my Sparmax Max 35 airbrush. I just got this. It's a .35 needle. Sprays beautifully. My Badger's in the shop right now. But the show must go on. Love it or hate it, Vallejo primers are pretty good. They lay very flat without the use of any type of thinner. The color stuff basically negates the need to base coat. So as you can see here, this is a one and done product. So why wouldn't you use it? But these primers are not without their drawbacks. They are very soft even after days of curing. So you have to be cognizant of that. And they clog your airbrush faster if you just took shit and then jammed it into the cup. All right, I know that was a little graphic, but you get the point. The stuff will clog your airbrush. So make sure you clean it out when you're done. It's always a good idea to mask things that you don't want to get hit with paint. I'm just going to mask these clear parts with some Vallejo masking fluid because I intend on going back with clear colors to simulate markers. And I want to put a metallic base behind them because it just looks better. Speaking of clear colors, we're going to take some of this Tamiya blue and some yellow and make a nice green haze that we can spray over our ballistic glass for that realistic look. Now here's where the magic happens. In order to spray this clear color, I have to add at least 75% isopropyl alcohol. Any of the store-bought stuff will do. Just make sure that it is blended well because you do not want to spray goopy, chunky clear colors out of your airbrush. You will have a disaster on your hands. And make sure before you actually use your concoction that you check the consistency. It should be something like skim milk, just like any other airbrushable paint. You're also going to want to test before you do the real deal. It should be translucent and spray easily at low pressure, just like I did on my paper towel here. Spraying clear paints can be tricky, but it doesn't have to be. In fact, it's like spraying any other paint out of your airbrush. Low pressure, fast passes, and if you do it right, you get yourself a nice piece of ballistic glass. This particular part's going to go in the commander's cupola right above a 50 cal machine gun. Spraying clear colors just looks way better than painting them on. It's just a cleaner application in my opinion. Got another tip. When you want to apply clear paints to something like lenses or markers, you want to use a toothpick instead of a brush. The toothpick allows you to just load the paint on and does not leave any brush marks. And with a little practice, you can get parts that look like this. You are not doing this with a brush, believe me. Now there's going to be parts like this periscope glass that you cannot use an airbrush or a toothpick to load clear paint. In that case, use a regular paintbrush, use very thin coats, but do it fast because when this stuff hits a surface, it begins to dry almost immediately. And the thinner the coat, the faster it will dry. And once it begins to dry, it turns into a very sticky consistency and it makes further application of paint very, very difficult without making it look like complete ass. Plastic mixing jars make excellent bases to spray small parts with. I must reiterate, if you install your glass before you prime, make sure you mask it because you do not want this stuff getting coated with your priming paint. It's going to look terrible. We're going to paint all of our road wheels, which are being held down with my high-tech paint application surface I made from an Amazon box and some blue painter's tape. $13,999 on my website if you're interested. Bruh.
1500 hours later, this is how far I've gotten. Due to my pure unadulterated hatred of painting road wheels, I've devised the asshole's way of cutting corners. Get yourself a little dish or some other surface that you can put some paint on. Get a cocktail stick, jam it in the ass end of your road wheels, and then go to town. I promise this will save you at least 25% of the time that you spend painting road wheels. And it's actually not that messy if you do it properly. Just going to take care of some detail painting real quick. Going to hit these guns up with Citadel Lead Belcher. It is my go-to color for machine guns, period. And we're going to hit up our accessories and ammo boxes and the like with some MIG Dark Green painted on with a brush in several coats. Uh, this stuff isn't the best brush painting paint. However, it does look pretty good when you actually get a couple coats on it. And some MIG Old Brass for that ass. What you know about them green tips? Not bad if I do say so myself. Hmm, that is spicy. It took me about five coats and about an hour and a half to get all these parts looking straight. It's important to note, do not try to paint all this in one go because you'll get weird buildup and it'll give your parts a really chunky textured appearance. That's what I like to see, a nice smooth application of paint. Don't rush it, take your time and you'll get great results, I promise. Now it's time for my two favorite techniques, airbrushing, highlighting, and artificial shading. These are important because they help break up the uniformity of what would be a very boring model that is a single color without any depth or contrast. With highlighting, you're taking a different, lighter tone of the base color that is already laid down and you are applying it to raised surfaces. And what this does is it gives depth to your vehicle. Highlighting is an important technique because not only does it bring visual interest to your build, it's also a form of color modulation that can be used in the weathering process, which would show wear or other types of abuse that a vehicle would see on the battlefield or in some other service. Shading, on the other hand, is a type of highlight, but it occurs on a specific part of the build and it's also a darker color so in this case we're using a complementary color like Vallejo US Modern Armor which is more brown than tan and we're going to go over the lower part of these ERA blocks. This is a way of making your build just look busier rather than again being one solid color. It's giving everything depth and it's more pleasing to look at and you'll hear people argue on how to actually do this properly. There is no real proper way to do it. You do what you think is going to look good. Think about it this way. Anything that's going to cast a shadow when it's hit with the sun is a good candidate for some kind of shading. R&R &R method works. Recesses and the borders of raised objects. And here I'm using shading as a form of modulation by just darkening up these turret cheeks because I think it's going to look better if the color is broken up. More. One of the other techniques that I really like is discoloration. I visualized this vehicle sitting out in the hot desert sun. Maybe there was some damage to the ERA blocks, they had to remove them, and in doing so, they put a different color block in. And that's what I'm trying to achieve here. You want to take a complementary color, but not something that is completely different. Like, don't put pink on a tan ERA block, it's going to look ridiculous. But something like a light green, a brown, a different shade of beige or tan, that's going to show that something has happened here. 
but it is not so drastic that it's going to completely change the motif of what you're trying to achieve. And if you're really feeling dangerous, you could do something like take a filter and change up the way your model looked before by adding another layer of color over the top of what you already done. And it's not going to change everything, it's just going to make it look a little bit different. In this situation, I'm using brown and orange filters just to change up this tan a little bit. The last part of the painting process is adding a varnish. What that's going to do is protect your paint and also give you a good base from which you can weather from. Everyone's got their own opinion about what the best type of varnish is to use. I tend to use Vallejo polyurethane varnishes because they spray nice and they thin down very, very easily with their own thinner. It's quick to dry, really resilient, and I've never gotten a weird texture effect, so I'm going to keep using this stuff. I find that two applications are about enough with an hour separating each. It'll give you a nice glossy surface from which you can start your weathering process. Also, just like paint, do not flood the surface of your build with this stuff because you will get ridiculous results if you do. I'm, I'm talking about orange peeling like a mo. Maniacs, we're done with the painting. We're gonna remove all of these masks and we're gonna prepare the surface for some tasteful weathering. Let's make a pin wash. Ibtalung 502 brown wash and also Abtalung 502 engine grease go together in perfect harmony with a little odorless thinner. Everyone knows why a pin wash is so important because it gives you more depth than you would be able to achieve without one. By using a highly thinned enamel or oil-based product like the pin wash that I just made, you're able to fill up all of the mold lines and make all of your beautiful details pop out more realistically than you would if you did not use a pin wash. And pin washes aren't just reserved for mold lines. You can use them on raised details and other recesses as well. They flow really nicely because they're so thin, so they'll get everywhere. And what it does is give a beautiful level of contrast that you would not be able to achieve by not using a wash. You have this light color for my build with this beautiful brown wash and they just complement each other perfectly. I mean, there's nothing that looks better and this is why it's so important. You may ask what color is good to use as a pin wash well it's totally up to you but in my personal opinion i like to use browns on lighter colors and up to about light green like like olive and i'll use black on dark green and grays and if something is darker than a gray i'll use a gray panel liner like if i have a black say uh, aircraft or something the gray complements black very well Now there's a multitude of products that you can go buy from like AK, MIG, Vallejo, Tamiya. You know, they'll all do the same thing as the wash that I made, but I don't want to pay for them because I have all this oil paint that is already in my stash and odorless enamel thinner for days. You can just make your own and it's just as good. It's actually, in my opinion, better. This is the part of the build where I just have garbage all over my fucking desk. And I'm pretty sure anyone would be able to sympathize with me because, you know, us modelers are pretty messy creatures by design. Look at that juicy capillary action. Yeah. How you all like the video so far? Hope you're really enjoying it. I really do put a lot of effort into this content. Please let me know down in the comments what you think. It'd really be helpful. Criticism or praise, I'll take either. Also, future builds. 
Don't forget them fucking <laughs> weld seams, you lazy bastards. Now, this may trigger some rivet counters, but I don't care. I fucking <laughs> hate rivet counters. So, that discoloration that I talked about previously, this is what I'm doing. I'm using some oil paint in this case. It's just some artist grade oils and some Ipilong 502 green. I think it's like an olive green. And I'm just discoloring some of these panels to break up the uniformity. And I think that it's going to look good after I overlay what I had already done with the airbrush. Not super realistic, but I like the way it looks and it gives your builds more character. I'm going to add some exhaust staining with some Vallejo Black and then blend in some white artist grade oil just to tone down the black a little bit and give it some bluing. You would think that some burning fuel would not be completely black. If you look at oil, it has a little bit of a blue or a white tinge to it. That's what I'm going for right here. So I bet you're wondering why I waited to do my track. Well, the answer is, on this particular build, something with armored skirts, it's really an afterthought. Because you're only going to see like 5 to 10% of the exposed track when the build is complete. It's not an excuse to be a lazy asshole. It's just, I would rather spend more time weathering something that is easily visible. Because Abrams tracks are not black or gunmetal, I had to make my own color. So basically what I did was I used some Vallejo Dark Rust, some Vallejo Medium Rust, and a little bit of Vallejo Sand. Mixed them together in a proportion that made them look like a dusty brown. And then I'm going along and painting all of these pads black. And this is a tester's flat black. It's one of my favorite black colors just because it has great coverage properties and it's super cheap. Painting pad sucks, but the result is satisfying. Not gonna go overboard with weathering on these tracks for the reasons that I stated prior, but I am gonna add some Vallejo sand wash. I do like using this stuff for tracks, even though it's an acrylic product. When it dries, it looks like residual sand that's left over, and being that this vehicle was in the Middle East, it's probably gonna have some sand left on the tracks, right? Quick caveat about acrylic washes. Be careful because they do dry permanently. Make sure you know what you're doing first. Now that the weathering is complete, you want to lock all this in with a nice satin varnish. And it's also going to tone down that gloss that's already on there. No one wants to see a shiny tank. Nothing like a nice low luster varnish on modern armor. It just looks so good. Maniacs, we have arrived at the end of the build, and I must say, I really do like the way this came out. I'm not just blowing air up anyone's ass. I really think that this build is better than a lot of the other ones that I've made in the past. All in all, this one took about four weeks to do, a couple hours a day here and there, and then about 10 hours to edit the video. So it was a very involved process, but I hope you all enjoyed it, and I hope you all learned something. Maybe you had some questions about particular weathering techniques. And if you do, let me know down in the comments and maybe I'll put something together. All right, it's time to part ways, but not for long. I already have another build on my bench as we speak. New people to my channel. If you like what you saw, please hit that subscribe button, like, comment, and share as well. It'll help me a lot. And I will see you guys next time. Take it easy and be safe.